civilization are mainly due to sin and should be corrected with a sense of sin. Let us leave it to the quiet, meek materialists to trace all ills to forces and balances, average and percentage. We ought to be tracing them where they are to be traced, to the seven deadly sins, to the avarice and pride and sloth and gluttony of everybody, and especially of ourselves. Now, here's an unpleasant topic, sin. But we're going to talk about it anyway. In fact, we're going to talk about seven unpleasant topics, as in the seven deadly sins. We'll try to balance the badness by also talking about virtue. However, virtue can also be an unpleasant topic because of our sins. It's uncomfortable to talk about right and wrong when we're wrong. The seven deadly sins are pride, avarice, envy, anger, gluttony, lust, and sloth. They can be listed separately, but it's difficult to discuss them separately. Though we may personally excel at certain sins, they're still all tied together. The sins have a way of sticking together. The virtues also have a way of sticking together. Interestingly enough, the virtues complement one another, while the vices seem to contradict each other. For instance, uh, St. Thomas Aquinas says that demons are frozen in pride and envy. Now, if you think about that, these are opposites. Pride is based on the idea that I am superior to you, and envy is based on the idea that you are superior to me, which is probably why St. Thomas also says that demons are not a happy tribe. And that's the main point about sin. It makes us unhappy. We sin, of course, thinking it's going to make us happy. Instead, it makes us unhappy. Happiness is based on obedience. It's what G.K. Chesterton calls the doctrine of conditional joy. It is illustrated so very well in the story of mankind's very first sin. The Garden of Eden was a paradise. The man and the woman enjoyed every delight and could continue to do so. They just had to follow one rule. Guess what? The whole human race has a tradition of the fall. Every cult and culture, one older than another, all lead back to that one idea, that man held happiness on a condition and is unhappy through breaking that condition. We even see this doctrine of conditional joy in fairy tales. Get home before midnight or your coach will turn into a pumpkin. Chesterton discovered all the great truths of mankind in the stories that he learned in the nursery. And sin, unfortunately, is one of those great truths. Sin is not merely a blunder, it's deliberate disobedience. It's an act of the will, and that is its shame. Obedience is also deliberate. It is also an act of the will, and that's its glory. For Chesterton, one of the most important doctrines in the Catholic Church, one that really sets it apart from all the ancient and modern heresies, is free will. It means that we can't blame our sins on anybody or anything else except ourselves. Evil is something we choose. It is true that on occasion we encounter evil that we have not chosen, but the question is, how will we respond? Who better to explain it than a priest? Chesterton's priest, Father Brown. Human troubles are mostly of two kinds. There is an accidental kind that we can't see because they're so close we fall over them as we do over a footstool. And there is the other kind of evil, the real kind. And that a man will go to seek, however far off it is, down down into the lost abyss. The seven deadly sins are not the mortal sins. They are not actual actions. They are the state that our soul has entered so that we commit acts of sins, including mortal sin. They're called deadly for the simple reason that if we pursue any of these sins, they will destroy us. People don't like to talk about sin. They prefer to talk about morality. Well, they don't like talking about morality either. Nevertheless, the word morality seems less harsh and more open to interpretation than the word sin. 
Chesterton is struck by the term current morality. It sounds better than current sin. But Chesterton wonders what the term current morality means. He suggests it means the morality that is always running away. He also observes that we don't really have disputes about what we call evil, only about what evils we call excusable. This is very dangerous. It's dangerous for our souls. A change has taken place. It is not so much in the sins for which individual sinners are punished as in the sins for which they are not punished. The sins that seem to be no longer regarded as sins at all. It is in the things taken for granted, the things passed over, even the things forgotten, that the glaring change appears. It is involved in the very words used to whitewash it. People say there were blackguards like that a hundred years ago and in every age. The answer is yes, there were blackguards like that a hundred years ago. But there were not respectable people like that a hundred years ago. Society did not assume a convention of sin, which only became unconventional when it actually turned into crime. It is not that more people have broken the law. It is that the law is broken, broken in the sense of having broken down. But just as there are no new sins, there are no former sins that have been upgraded into virtues. Morality has not changed in spite of our attempts to change it. We try to defy sin, but we only defy God with the same old sins. But the main reason that we no longer recognize sin is that we no longer recognize virtue. The terrible danger at the heart of our society is that the tests are giving way. We are altering not the evils, but the standard of good, which is the only standard by which any evil can be detected and defined. There is one institution in the world that still calls sin, sin. It is the Catholic Church, which is ironically made up entirely of sinners. And yet the Church has the unenviable task of explaining that there are things in the world that the world holds up as rights that are actually wrongs. The Church will not compromise with sin. In other words, it will not excuse sin. But it will forgive sin. Not compromising with sin is an act of mercy. Because only by admitting sin, admitting that sin is sin, is what will make us better. It's called confession. There are many critics who claim that it is morbid to confess your sins. But the morbid thing is not to confess them. The morbid thing is to conceal your sins and let them eat away at your soul, which is exactly the state of most people in today's highly civilized communities. It sometimes does people good to punish them. It often, probably more often, does them good to pardon them. It more often does them good to understand them and so absolve them with a serious spiritual authority. The new ways of dealing with sin don't work, only the old way. But the old way has become the new way, since the new ways have failed and continue to fail. Chesterton says, It is of the new things that men tire, of fashions and proposals and improvements and change. It is the old things that startle and intoxicate. It is the old things that are young. And so, let's talk about the seven deadly sins. Chesterton's friend and fellow writer Dorothy L. Sayers once recounted that someone said to her, I didn't realize there were seven deadly sins. What are the other six? What adds to the amusement of that comment is that this person never said what he thought the one deadly sin was. We can tell you, however, what the worst of the seven deadly sins is. It is pride. All the sins are a form of self-indulgence, but pride is the chief sin, and humility is the chief virtue. God's greatest demonstration of his love was an act of humility, becoming a man, sacrificing himself, dying a horrible death to save his own creation. Likewise, all human love 
which is but a dim reflection of divine love, is an act of humility. Love is emptying of the self, directing our attention, our affection, our concern, our effort, our will to God and our neighbor, who's made in the image of God and is, is sometimes mysterious as God. Pride, says Chesterton, is the ultimate human evil. It's the last insult to God. It is the sin that denies sin. It means failing in self-criticism and abounding in self-praise. Chesterton said that if he were a preacher and he had only one sermon to preach, it would be a sermon against pride. The more I see of existence, the more I am convinced of the reality of the old religious thesis, that all evil began with some attempt at superiority. Pride, you see, is a poisoning so very poisonous that it not only poisons the virtues, it even poisons the other vices. The wickedest work in this world is symbolized not by a wine glass, but by a looking glass. And it is not done in public houses, but in the most private of all private houses, which is a house of mirrors. Pride consists in a man making his personality the only test, instead of making the truth the test. Is it not true that pride gives to every other vice an extra touch of the intolerable. I think the instinct of mankind against pride as the ultimate human evil can be proved from the most prosaic of details. Nobody ever hated a miser. Fundamentally, everybody pitied him. The miser never minded looking like a fool. Therefore, men have always joked about the miser. The real beggar was funny. The false beggar was even funnier. The usurers and princes of avarice were never hated until there had been added to them that dynamite detail which we call pride. But our modern rich have abandoned the wise precautions of the misers of old. The misers hid their wealth. Today's millionaires display it. The miser is ashamed of being a miser, but our modern millionaire is not ashamed of being a millionaire. He believes that since he admires himself, all other men will admire him as well. I believe the sin of pride is at the root of all other sins. Gluttony is a great fault, but we do not necessarily dislike a glutton. We only dislike the glutton when he becomes the gourmet. That is, we only dislike him when he not only wants the best for himself, but when he knows what is best for other people. It is the poison of pride that has made this difference. Sloth is a great fault, but we do not necessarily dislike the sluggard. We only dislike the sluggard when he becomes the aesthete, the man who need not do anything, but need only, only exist beautifully. It is the poison of pride again that has made the difference. And that is why Chesterton said that if he had only one sermon to preach, he was confident that he would not be asked to preach another. The next deadly sin? Avarice. Greed. The idea that more money, more wealth, more of everything is always better. There are many definite methods, honest and dishonest, which make people rich. The only instinct I know of that drives such methods is that instinct which theological Christianity crudely describes as the sin of avarice. It is not mere business. It is mysticism, the horrible mysticism of money. 
Avarice is the sin that sustains unbridled capitalism. But it's also the great temptation of the politician. It can subject him to blackmail or even treason. In other words, it can lead not only to his own ruin, but the ruin of a nation or, or the state that he serves. A politician's blunders may not be his fault, but his scandals are his fault. While avarice feeds the flame of big industry and big industrialists and big politicians who would do their bidding, it also feeds smaller flames to the ruin of smaller men. All those get-rich-quick schemes and books on success, Chesterton says, they do not teach people to be successful, but they do teach people to be snobbish. They spread a sort of evil poetry of worldliness. The Puritans are always denouncing books that inflame lust, and what shall we say of books that inflame the viler passions of avarice and pride? The first way to get rid of avarice, as of any sin, is to repent. But Chesterton says we've lost the idea of repentance, especially in public things. And that is why we cannot really get rid of our great national abuses in both our economic and our political tyrannies. Avarice was one sin that did not tempt G.K. Chesterton. I am not interested in wealth beyond the dreams of avarice, since I know that avarice has no dreams, but only insomnia. The insomnia of the rich is an old problem. We see it revealed in the Old Testament book of Ecclesiastes. Sweet is the sleep of the laborer, whether he has eaten little or much, but the surfeit of the rich will not let him sleep. This brings us to the next deadly sin, a sin that can also lead to sleepless nights. Envy. Chesterton mostly refers to envy in a paradoxical sense. He says that he envies people caught in the London flood because they know what it's like to live in Venice. And he envies people stranded on a desert island because they know what it's like to have peace and quiet. He even points out the strange lack of envy in the modern world, saying that there's something wrong in a society when ordinary people are out of touch with ordinary sins. Just as it is a bad economic sign in the state that masses of our fellow citizens are too poor to be taxed, so it is a bad ethical sign in the state that masses of our neighbors have become too dulled to be envied. That sort of superiority to envy is not enviable. There is something wrong with a man if he does not want to break the Ten Commandments. You heard that right. There is something wrong with a man who does not want to break the Ten Commandments. If the conditions of our society have dulled our free will, we've lost our human dignity. Sin is supposed to be a temptation. We could even say sin is supposed to be easy. It usually is. The difficult thing is to be good, to be virtuous, to be obedient. It's a choice, a difficult choice to make, the choice not to sin. If we become so numbed, so passive as to not be tempted, well, we're, we're probably guilty of the sin of sloth. We'll talk about sloth later, if we feel like it. Back to envy. The uh, envious man is not content to live his own life, but wants to live everyone else's life. He's not content to be himself. He wants to be everyone else. Most of advertising is designed directly on appealing to the sin of envy. Every available flat surface is plastered with the image of somebody who has something that you don't have, and you are made to feel that you won't be happy unless you have it too. Most of our accomplishments in commerce and industry are driven by envy. The economists call it competition, and they say it's a good thing. But it always makes people compromise their virtues. There are two virtues to counter the sin of envy. Kindness and contentment. One has to do with our relationship with our neighbor, and the other with our relationship with God. In other words obeying the great commandments of loving God and loving our neighbor. That's what makes us fulfilled. Happiness is a choice. We can choose to be happy rather than imagining ourselves unhappy because we do not have something that someone else has, or being unhappy simply because someone else is happy. If we rejoice with those who rejoice, we are rejoicing. We're not envying. 
If we're busy being kind to our neighbor, we are less driven to envy him. And if we're content with what God has given us, we're less likely to envy our neighbor. Both virtues are based on thankfulness. Chesterton says thanks is the highest form of thought. He tells us to be pleased, positively pleased, with what we have. Being content with bread and cheese ought not to mean not caring what you eat. It ought to mean caring for bread and cheese, handling and enjoying the cubic content of the bread and cheese, and adding it to your own. True contentment is the power of getting out of a situation all that there is in it. The voices of the saints and sages recommending contentment should sound unceasingly like the sea. Next, we're going to talk about anger. We're out of time. What? We're out of time. Well, I want to talk about anger right now. Now. Um, we'll, we'll talk about anger next time. And the other deadly sins. Right now, I'm going to go and talk to a priest about anger. This is Dale Alquist. Join us again on the Apostle of Common Sense.